Continue to enjoy your breakfast, but we have a field day. We want to try to stay on schedule as much as we've been able to um, the previous days of the week. I have a special treat, and it's a real pleasure for me to present our, our morning speaker. Well, actually, let's introduce him. Just most of you have not had a chance to meet him yet. But I will say this, he was next to the last person on the last bus from Castle Larga last evening. He, he's the kind that would have gone down on the Titanic. He said, all the women and children go ahead first. So, but Seth Dickinson is a proud seventh generation Mississippian from Mantachie, Mississippi. And he is the son of a rural county sheriff and a registered nurse. Seth graduated from the University of Mississippi with degrees in public policy, leadership, sociology in 2018, and the doctorate of jurisprudence in 2021. You heard me say he graduated from the University of Mississippi, who while we were here won the College World Series championship. And I know there's some Ole Miss fans in the room, and he proudly wears, he proudly wears his red and blue tie uh, to recognize his allegiance to Ole Miss. Seth has worked as a policy analyst and lobbyist in Washington, D.C., as a community development advisor for towns in rural Mississippi and the Law and Policy Association for the Mississippi Governor's Office. Currently, Seth serves as a judicial law clerk for the Mississippi Supreme Court. Seth is a survivor of a massive brain aneurysm and stroke that left him paralyzed at the age of 18. Through his recovery, Seth used his faith and fortitude of the state of Mississippi to inspire recovery. He has relayed his story of hope and inspiration in churches, civic groups, and schools in every county of Mississippi. In addition to his work in politics, law, and policy, Seth enjoys gardening, golfing, golfing, and publishing research on Mississippi history, healthcare policy, and higher education. I am proud to present my friend, Seth Dickinson. Good morning. I am much obliged to be here. And if there's any good thing about having a speaker from the great state of Mississippi is that I want you to keep eating. Please, <laughs> please keep eating. Uh, there are no greater sounds, I think, uh, than eating food, laughter, and of course, my Ole Miss Rebels winning the national championship. I, I am honored to be here. Way, I am way, way far away from home. But to see my fellow Mississippians and their friends and their colleagues, I know that this place is home too. Rochester for me, funny enough, is a place I had an ancestor from. It was not too far after I found out that I would be speaking here that I did some research on Ancestry.com. And in 1831, in March, there was a William Dickinson in Rochester, New York. But by March of 1832, he had gone back south. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking the only thing that could have happened between March and March of that year was winter in Rochester, New York. <laughs> so on behalf of myself and all Dickinsons, thank you for having this during summer. I am so glad to be here. If there's anything I want you to know about me first and foremost is that I'm proud of where I'm from. I'm proud of the place that made me, me. I am from a town called Mantachie in a county called Etowomba in a state called Mississippi. Those are all really funny words, <laughs> full of really funny people. But I am so blessed. I always love to share that the reason my part of the state was settled was because of pottery. 
the soil in northeast Mississippi was so fine and porous and full of the right sedimentary materials that it made for the best pottery in all of America. And the joke is that was the first legal industry in North Mississippi. <laughs> it wasn't what was in the bottle, but what made the bottle up. <laughs> and to me, after being there for all of my life until recently, I'm so proud of that fact, that a place where the people that settled there took from the earth, took from the soil, worked with their hands, made vessels, and then put it through the fire to make something greater than it was before. That's the story of me, of many of you, and certainly of the state of Mississippi, to take something and put it through the fire. We have been through a lot these past few years. We have been socially apart at least physically, but that, that's, so, that's so untrue. If the pandemic has taught me anything, it's that groups like this, we're together more than we've ever have been in one common mission. I know the motto of Pilot International is true course ever. And I see that every day. Every day, and especially through this past week, and seeing that no matter what happens, all of you have kept the course, have stayed true to what you've been clandestinely bound to do. And I'm proud of that. You know, I'm a very boring bureaucratic lawyer in the state of Mississippi. And I take pride in the first jury trial I ever went to. Uh, an older attorney looked at me and he said, you gotta watch out for those jurors. They're in the pilot club. And I laughed. You know, I'm from Mantachi. I, I knew my local pilots. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they're in the pilot club. I said, yeah, well, what do you mean? He said, that means they're going to take everything you say and analyze it thoroughly and consistently. And they ain't going to like you, son. Your socks don't match. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, I looked down and my socks didn't match. And that day in Justice Court in Cahoma County, Mississippi, I lost. I lost very badly. But nonetheless, we kept fighting. And that's why I'm here today. As President Cross mentioned, I've had quite a life in my 26 years. I've lived, I've learned, and I've lost. And I want to share a bit of that with you. Because me, I'm here today and I'm blessed. But there have been a few hiccups and bumps in the road that have made me who I am, being put through that fire. I was 18 years old, a normal college freshman at Ole Miss, happy-go-lucky, exercising, getting turned down on many dates. <laughs> normal, normal I think. But I'm home on spring break March 2015, I'm working out one night, Saturday. The next day I was going back to Oxford to move back into the dorm. I get a headache. I don't think anything of it. I think this is me overexerting myself. I go down, tell my mother, I think it's just a headache. Go back to my room. I get on the phone with a friend we were calling each other to talk, tell each other good night. And during that conversation on the phone at 18 years old, I stopped being able to think. And not many 18-year-old men think in general. <laughs> but especially in that call, I, I lost it. And she's on the phone and she realizes so, something's wrong. My speech started to slur. I get off the phone, they realize something's terribly wrong. She says, call your mother. I try. I'm holding my phone at 18 years old, looking down at the screen and seeing mother. And I'm trying to move my thumb from one side of the phone to the next. 
that I couldn't. Finally, finally, I, I get my thumb over, I hit the contact, it calls, I drop down. I'm lying in my bed, the phone drops, and the only words I could get out to my mom were, were come here. My mother's registered nurse, uh, she knew something was up. She rushes upstairs, she does the protocols, and she says, Seth, we need to take you to the hospital. I think, oh, okay, that's really strange, um, but okay. I get to the top of my stairs, she's frantically calling my dad uh, to pull the truck around, take me to the hospital. I'm awake at this point. I'm very, very aware of what's going on. What I was not aware of at that moment was that from that first headache, my life expectancy was six minutes. Six minutes I had from when the aneurysm had formed to when I was supposed to have died. Surprise, I'm here. I get to the bottom of the stairs. I want to stand up. I do. Things are getting better. I think it's passing. I get halfway across our living room, and I hear a pop. And I feel a pop. And your brain is not something you're aware you have until you feel it. It's not a good feeling, I'll tell you that much. I pass out. I fall to the floor. I'm looking up at the ceiling, and things start to go black. The six-minute timer had been ticking at this point. I didn't know that. I'm lying in my floor at 18 years old, looking up at the ceiling, and a thought hits me that I can still feel. The thought was, Seth, how ironic is it that the floor that you grew up in is the floor you're going to die in? And that's not a thought you want to have at 18. But as I'm lying there, I could think, I could hear. My mother was holding me. And I remember as things start blurring out around the edges, Seth, no, no, you cannot die in your mother's arms. She could not live with herself. So I tried to keep my cool, slow my heart rate down. It's just not working. They take me to the hospital in Tupelo, which is about 20 miles from where I'm, I live. They immediately put me on life support. I remember that. I remember everything about those moments. Because even in the times I couldn't speak, I couldn't communicate, I couldn't move, I could hear. I remember hearing the ride to Memphis in the ambulance, the sirens, the paramedics, the beeps. I could hear. Words mattered. I knew what they were saying. They take me to Methodist, Uni Methodist University Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, and take me to surgery. Most poignantly, I remember them pulling my family into a room and the doctors saying, we don't know what's going to happen. Be with him. We don't know what's next. I could hear that. The next thing I remember is being in an operating room of hearing sounds, feeling nothing. And then in an instant, I'm looking down at myself. This is, this is really strange. Why am I looking at me? What's going on here? Put that back. There's this man inside my head. Get out. I look down. I get cold. I look up. Things don't just go black for me in that instant when I felt what I thought was my final breath. I look, at, look up and I see things. I see memories. I see my childhood. I see those first steps, those first core vivid memories, starting school at Mantachi, growing up as the son of the sheriff, church revivals, fun things. I see high school. 
I see graduation. I see the college times. I see all the memories I had. And I think to myself, wait, slow down. There's nothing much after this. And I see those last few memories of, of college and spring break and the trip and getting back home. And I think, stop, stop, please, please stop, God, let this stop. And the last thing I see is myself looking down at myself. And then things stop. They go black. But it doesn't just stop there. Because what I saw next changed my life. For the better, I think. Changed my life, certainly as a professional, but as a man, as a person with a mission. Because what I saw, since there were no memories left, I saw every regret that I ever had. I saw every time I was angry and should not have been. Every time I was quick to a snarky remark and should not have been. I saw every time I should have told somebody I loved them, but did not. And in that I realized that death is not finality. Death is not the pain. The real horror of life ending is regret. Because you live that again and again. And of course what happens next is it's a much longer story. But I am so blessed that I was able to survive that surgery. To come back. Paralyzed albeit. Initially from the neck down. Unable to move anything. Unable to talk. But I could hear, and I could hear the people around me crying, praying, but being there for me. And even though I couldn't say anything back to them, I knew they were there. Finally, on March 26th, 2015, I was moved to Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, a research hospital. And on day one, they, they, they scaled me. On a scale of zero to 100, zero being you're nothing. There's nothing here to work with. 100 being you're normal, you're pre-morbid. I was a four. And in the anchors, you might get this when I say that I'm used to being a four on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> on a scale of to zero to 100, I, I was not used to that. I was nothing, but I could hear the prognoses that Mr. and Mrs. Dickinson, Seth might need care for the rest of his life. They didn't sit well with me. So on day one of therapy, those therapists, those doctors, they believed in me. They tried. I knew that if they were going to give a chance on me, that I was going to take it. I was going to work it. This was not going to be another regret that I was going to have. So, on day one, I try to stand up in therapy. I fall down. Breaks my heart to go back to the room that night. I knew nothing, nothing was happening. There was no, no chance. I was 18 years old, living my best life, and now I'm stuck. And in my bed that night in Atlanta, Georgia, Looking up at the ceiling again, a thought hit me that changed my life. That thought was, Seth, you're stuck. You are trapped in your own body. You are trapped in your circumstances. But there are people back home that are trapped too. Maybe not like you. Maybe by other decisions, health care, access to education. Seth, by gosh, they're trapped. And you've been given this chance to live. You've got to do something with it. And so, two days later, I make a note to my therapist. Take me to the mirror. And so they do. 
and the first words I uttered to myself in that mirror. And I looked at myself, I said, Seth, are you ready? And to me, that call to action was, was I ready to do something with my story, with my circumstances? And by the grace of God and the support of members of my community, organizations like yours, the helmet people, the brain people, I'm back. It took a while, it was not easy. I was a terrible patient in the hospital. My, my claim to fame at Shepherd Center is that I'm the reason that all the patients have cable now. <laughs> because for a while, an infomercial played on loop in the TV. That was terrible. So in the gym, in the rehab corridor, I would roll myself to the other patients and I said, all right, by the time that second dog barks, get in your chairs, roll out in the hallway, and put the brakes on. We're not gonna move until we get a new channel. And so, and so by that second bark, I was ready. I had told my mother, so you need to take a nap, mama. I got something to do. And so I roll myself out in the hallway, and it's just me. It's just me sitting there. And I'm like, oh no, what have I done? They're gonna leave me hanging. But little by little, my, my friends, my fellow patients, they rolled themselves out. And the nurses are like, what the heck is going on with all of y'all? And we said, we ain't moving. And for 45 minutes, we clogged the hallways of that hospital. <laughs> and that's when they learned that the state of Mississippi in Georgia can give you some heck. And to this very day, they have unlimited access to all the channels they want. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But, but there was, and there is a certain beauty to being at a place like that at Shepherd Center. The beauty of hope and recovery in yourself, but also the beauty in seeing the others around you fight too. I remember being in therapy several times and looking to my right and seeing people who were better off than me. They had recovered, they had, they had gotten better, they were getting better, I could be that too. And in the same room, look to my left and see people that were so much worse off than me. People that may never walk again, that may never talk again. And realizing, Seth, here you are somewhere in the middle between hope and the hospitality that these people deserve to fight and get better too. And from the people that told me that I would never possibly walk again, I walked out of that hospital to my car and right back home to the great state of Mississippi. <coughs> Heck yeah, thank you. Please don't waste your applause on me. I'm, I'm just here to talk. I'm a lawyer, we love to talk. Please. But going back to Ole Miss, I realized I had to use my degree to do something with it. So I did. I got involved. I got invested. Not because of any volition of my own, but because there are people back home, namely the pilot clubs of Manteshi and Houston and Fulton. The ladies you all know as your friends, I know as my family. Because at the end of the day, when I was still recovering, I knew that I had people praying for me. And I know now that through the networks you all share, you all took part in that too. And that's special. That is special for me as somebody with an acquired brain injury, to know that there is a national organization of women and men, of girls, of boys. You all share a common mission to give resources, advocacy, and opportunity to people you don't know. I could go to my pilots back home and tell them thank you, thank you, thank you, day in and day out. 
Well, it is a very special opportunity for me to be here today to see all of you and say thank you. Y'all are doing the thing. You know, the little engine that could, by gosh, you did. You did the thing, and nothing has stopped you. Mississippi is a state named after a river. And I like to think of my life and all of our lives to be like a river. We all start out as a stream, our own little bubbling brook, heading out. Somewhere out there is our gulf. Whatever is the end is our gulf. And a little stream becomes a creek that becomes a river, not because of its own strength, but because it allows others to pour into it. Not because of one body of water, but because of many others pouring in. The ladies back home, the men back home poured into me. We are all products of our own tributaries. For me, that was heading towards my gulf, which was getting back home, recovering. For others, that's different things. But a river, like the pilots, keeps a true course ever. A river only has one objective, to get where it's going and fast. A river allows other bodies to pour into it. A river allows nothing to stop it. Mountains are carved into gorges because of rivers, because of more force being pushed in. No matter what happens, a river will always keep rolling along. No matter what they try to put in its way, it will keep rolling along. The state of Mississippi, where I take most of my inspiration, is a state that despite its many obstacles has kept rolling along. I'm inspired every day by groups like this, specifically this group. A pandemic came, ladies and gentlemen, and you kept rolling along. You met virtually. You're still giving out helmets, protecting people. You're still putting on seminars, workshops. And you're being parts of communities that we're losing. You know, I saw many community groups that I had done advocacy work for fall apart in a pandemic that never met again. We're here two years out from the start of a pandemic and you're meeting together on a national stage in Rochester, New York. What more can be said about each of you being a river pouring into each other than the fact that the true course has stayed ever true? That's special. I'm very blessed, not because just of my story, but because I can be a part of yours. I can meet all of you from across the country and the world, of course, to dine with you, to fellowship with you, and know that I'm a product of your work. All that you do is so important. And as an 18-year-old young man, I, I knew the pilots. Most of them had taught me in school. One of them even paddled me. <laughs> but never would I think that eight years later, I would be standing here, one, standing in general, or speaking, but being able to tell each of you in this room today, the work you do is so, so appreciated. There are millions of people that you have touched their lives. Many of them may not be able to convey this. Many of them may not know the chance or how. But thank you. Th sincerely, thank you. I know you're going to celebrate tonight the work you've done, but take it from somebody who has benefited from what you have done. Thank you. You all are the mightiest river I have ever seen. Not just because two of you threw out my first jury trial, because one of you paddled me, and because the rest of you are feeding me. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I stand amazed 
at all you've done. And I know that I'm supposed to be the inspirational message. You are. You are. When I teach class at Ole Miss, I teach a bunch of freshmen, and the first thing I tell them is, look, you don't know what's next for you. So to the anchors, the navigators, all of you, you don't know what's next. But you are surrounded by people that care for you. Be your own river. Pour into others. And together, nothing can stop you. If me, a redneck from northeast Mississippi, can argue cases at the Supreme Court, can go bowl with senators, and win, might I add, <laughs> you can do anything. I love your mission statement. I love reading it. I love that I can go up the road to New Albany, Mississippi, and see the president of an of a national, international club. That's special. And before I close, I want to tell you, I don't know you. You don't know me. But I don't have to know all of you personally to know very sincerely what you stand for, to know who you are, what you're about, and the fact that the course will stay true. And so I will not ever miss the opportunity to tell you, before I regret it when I die, that I thank you and I love you. And I hope that sometime today you will look at your fellow members and tell them, hey, I love you. Because you never know when that last breath might come, the last drop of your river might go into some great gulf somewhere in the yonder. Take every chance you can to keep rolling along together in love and in hospitality. I appreciate you for having me. I thank you and I love you. God bless you and God bless the state of Mississippi. Thank you, thank you. I'm back, I'm back. You know, the only thing that was missing from a Seth's presentation, he didn't say, bless your heart. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Seth, thank you for sharing your amazing story. Um, he is an inspiration to anyone that comes in contact with him. And uh, it's just absolutely wonderful that you could join with us. Uh, on behalf of Pilot International, I'd like to present you with a little something for, to show our appreciation and thank you for being with us. So that's something maybe you can use on your desk in your office. Okay. And then second to that, I'm very pleased to present you a certificate of honorary membership in Pilot International. That's the wrong certificate, just take it and I'll return it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we're very hopeful that in the near future, Seth will add to that a certificate of membership. He, he has secured a list of individuals from the Jackson, Mississippi area and gotten verbal commitments from 15 individuals that say they are ready to join Pilot. <laughs> we have had clubs in the Jackson area in the years, but like so many areas, some of the others of you, we've had those clubs to disband. So in the words of uh, Carol Riddell, we're gonna strike while the iron is hot. And, and take him up on that. But Seth, thank you so very thank much. You. Thank you. Before our break, I want to take a few moments to, to share with you the state of our organization. During the 100 year anniversary celebration last year in Atlanta, I stated that if Pilot was to exist for another 100 years, 
that we must work together to increase our membership in our clubs and increase the clubs in our district. Clubs were asked to get asked to work together to try to, to gain, have a three to five member net gain in their membership this year. And districts were asked to try to charter one club this year. Pilots embraced my goal to increase membership. Many clubs did add three or more members. Since July 1, 2021, and as of June 20, 2022, we have gained 542 new members. <laughs> Unfortunately, during that time, we have lost 772 members. We have approximately 180 less members now than we did at the beginning of the year. As a result of the pandemic, Pilot exp um, experienced a 16-month decline in membership from August, excuse me, from April 2020 until September 2021. However, I am happy to report that the trend turned around in October 2021, and we have had a net gain with a plateau one month of membership. So we hope that that trend will continue in an upward trend and we will overcome that deficit. We currently have approximately 5,540 members. Our membership became dangerously close to dropping below 5,000. We are encouraged by this upward trend and are optimistic that it will continue. And I just realized um, I meant to call to your attention, there is a, pro a page in your program that has state of the organization where that you can fill in some information as it's given to you. I hope this will be helpful when you go back and report to your clubs. And I apologize for not calling your attention to that. Anchor clubs, especially those that were school-based, were greatly stymied by the pandemic. Many were not allowed to meet and some not even to allowed to collect dues. Fortunately, that has not been the case this year and anchors are back stronger than ever. Four anchor clubs have been chartered this year. One, uh, the J.L. Mann High School Anchor Club in South Carolina District, Central Eleuthera High School in the Bahamas, Carrollton High School and Milton High School in the Georgia District. Congratulations to those districts for helping grow pilot through anchor. We currently have 6,648 anchors in 200 clubs. Compass has also grown this year with the chartering of the second Compass Club in the Bahamas District. The addition of this club brings our number of Compass Clubs to six with 60 members. Three districts, the Bahamas District, Texas District, uh, were successful in chartering five pilot clubs. In addition to being the, <clears throat> excuse me, and I may say this more than once, but something happened in the Bahamas district this year that may be a first. They had a trifecta in the fact that they chartered an anchor club, a compass club, and a pilot club. We have talked that um, we have continued to miss our Japanese pilot friends, and this is the third year that they have not been able to attend a PI convention, and this year they have chartered two clubs in the Japan District. The Texas District chartered two clubs this year, with one being chartered on June the 30th. In addition to being the most caring people in the world, pilots are the most generous. Contributions to Giving Tuesday totaled $43,568.80, which exceeded our goal by almost $19,000. These funds were designated for goals and scholarships. 
In observance of our 100-year anniversary, Envision 100 was announced in Atlanta last year with a goal to raise $150,000. To do that, and for those funds would be used to award 100 grants in 2022-2023, and the results of the Envision 100 campaign will be announced later this morning. We have had 305 individuals donate to Envision 100. Of the 305 donors, 100 of them were first-time donors. Of that 100 first-time donors, 88 were outside of pilot. And this is what we want to do, is to secure new donors this year and also tap into those resources for revenue development outside of pilot clubs. On March 21, which was the 100th day until the beginning of the 2022 convention, we challenged pilot members to help identify 100 new donors to Envision 100. And pilots, in true fashion, met that challenge, and we did identify exactly 100 new donors. Thank you for accepting that challenge, and we only wished we had challenged you to find more. Pilot International's mission is to influence change, positive change in communities throughout the world. And this is accomplished through our scholarship and grant program. Since 1985, Pilot International has awarded $1,932,263.63 in matching grants and emergency grants. That is almost $2 million since 1985. Now, some of you in the room were not born in 1985. <laughs> some of us don't think that was very long ago. <laughs> but regardless of how you look at 1985, $2 million is a lot of money to put in the hands of scholarship recipients and grants. Since 1953, which was one year after Anchor was established, $1,438,492.68 has been awarded in scholarships. My quick math tells me that's almost $3.5 million that has been awarded in grants and scholarships since 1953. And absolutely. And we don't know, and we'll never know, the impact that those grants and scholarships have made in the lives of the recipients and the effect it had and those that they touched as a result of those awards. Two emergency response grants totaling $8,873 were funded for the Pilot Club of Fort Pierce, Florida and the Pilot Club of Lancaster this year. We have awarded Peep Me Up grants to 22 clubs totaling $4,368.50 and Helmet grants to 13 clubs totaling $3,750 this year. Contributions honoring our club and ambassadors support the Safe Harbor Fund. Safe Harbor is a, a grant program that assists pilots who are impacted by disasters. Only one grant was um, apl applied for this year, which is a good thing, and it was awarded. And thanks to the 210 clubs who honored 221 ambassadors, $7,638 was added to the Safe Harbor Fund. So in the event an disaster occurs, we have a bank and we have funds banked to go to them. The scholarship committee had an extremely difficult task in selecting 38 recipients from the 182 applications that were received. The amount of scholarships awarded was $40,300. So we hope that when we hear about Envision 100, 
we will be able to announce a larger number of scholarships to be awarded and more money to be given. If you had the opportunity to visit headquarters last year, you saw the beautifully sculptured tree in the donor room displaying the names of the individuals, clubs, and districts who generously support Pilot International. 250 status is available to members, clubs, and districts. 98 pilots, 259 clubs, and 17 districts are recognized in the convention program for reaching 250 status. The President's Circle is the designation for individuals who contribute $1,000 or more each year. And this year, 51 pilots attained President's Circle status. And in your program, convention program, you will see the names of the individuals, clubs, and districts that uh, were 250 member status in the President's Circle. Unfortunately, the name of Beverly Sheen, who is a 21-22 PI director's name, was omitted from the President's Circle. And we certainly want to recognize and have um, Beverly in that listing. Pilot International depends on pace setter clubs for their contributions to the general fund, which allocates funds to where they're needed most. Clubs contributing $10 per active member are recognized as pace setter clubs. We're pleased to announce that 236 pace setter clubs made contributions totaling $42,435 this year. Our endowment, which exceeds $1 million, assures that Pilot International can be sustained for another 100 years plus. The search for the executive director is continuing. Pilot is a unique organization, and we need a unique individual to meet the needs of our organization. Our goal is to employ an executive director who will embrace our mission, our focus areas, and lead revenue development and growth efforts. The search for a youth development specialist also continues. I ask that we focus on Forward Together, Believe in the Possibilities in 2021-2022. I hope the information that you have heard today confirms that Pilot International is moving forward. Are we where we want to be? Not yet. But if individual pilots, clubs, and districts continue to believe in the possibilities, we will go forward, growing pilot, compass, and anchor. Thank you for uh, allowing me to serve as your president this year, and thank you for what you have done to support Pilot International. At this time, and I don't even know where we are on the program as far as time is concerned, but um, is Melody Merritt in the room? Melody, would you come and join me, please? <laughs> Come on, close. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be in front of the camera. <laughs> she said she wasn't supposed to be in front of the camera. Okay. I talked a little bit about um, the pick me ups that we've given this year. Seth referenced how much that pick me ups in different forms have been to him and, and other patients uh, at the Shepherd Center and at home. Melody has been doing the, being our photographer for about, what, six years? Six years. Four of those six years, Melody has been caring for her mother. So Melody is a caregiver. And two days ago, Melody's mother was admitted to hospice care. Melody, we want to present you with a pick-me-up to let, we, let you know that we recognize the road that you're on and this is just something to let you know that we do recognize that. We'll be thinking about you. Thank you. I didn't get a picture of this, did I? <laughs> At this time, would you like to take about a 15-minute break?
Okay. We will return at 10, 10.15, 10.15.